Okay, so um, that's me, and uh, it's, it's now very much the, the fashion, isn't it, that when a speaker starts a talk, they, they declare their interests. Um, and, uh, and of course, then you get someone sort of coming out with this long list of, uh, of you know, pharmaceutical companies that have thrown loads of money at them. I'm just going to declare one interest, because it occurred to me that um, I have a certain angle on this, and it's due to the fact that not only do I I'm chair the uh, cellular pathology NQOP, I'm also a member of the joint working group on quality assurance, and um, the, 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 uh, the, the joint working group are begin to kind of form a certain view on the way forward, which may differ from um, that of other August bodies, such as the Royal College. Right, so what am I going to tell you about? Well, the PQAR, or Barnes Report, as it's kind of um, more generally known after its, uh, its, its author in Barnes. So what, was, what, recommend, what the key recommendations were, and what the, what are the implications for the future of EQA? Now, this was published in was it January 2014, so a fair bit of time has elapsed, and I'm going to comment on what has and hasn't happened since, and also my take on the implications of the report. I would add, of course, that I'm from a cellular pathology background, so that gives me a bit of a slant on it, but I think the, the significance is that most QA in cellular pathology is interpretive, and interpretive EQA is, I think, a particular challenge going forward, but it's something that I think we have to rise to challenge to take the bull by the horns. Okay, so this gentleman here, Sir Bruce Keogh, Medical Director of NHS England, and he doesn't look very pleased, does he? What displeased him? Well, some of you may recognise this rather impressive building, um, which is the new Kings Mill Hospital. And um, I don't want to go into uh, in, in too much detail about what happened there, because I mean, that is a matter of, of record, and I think there are different takes on it. But suffice it to say that an incident at um, Sherwood Forest Hospitals relating to uh, the quality assurance of um, estrogen receptor testing in breast cancer alerted Bruce Keogh to the fact that if you don't do pathology QA properly, and that's the whole process, then it can have real adverse consequences for patient care. So anyway, he commissioned a report, and um, many of you will know Ian Barnes, um, and uh, Ian led this. Now, um, three PQAR EQA governments. So, so just have a little look at this. This is the theory of um, what's supposed to happen. Well, you have a pathology provider, which may be, I mean, in, in, in the UK, the, the general model is it's an NHS trust, but of course there are other providers as well. Um, within that provider, you would typically have, if it's not purely a freestanding pathology provider, you'll have a pathology directorate. And there should be a sort of um, an internal dialogue <laughs> about QA, so that's the theory. But of course, um, we pathologists um, are responsive to um, external stimuli of various sorts. Obviously, UCAS, um, a leading um, accreditation organization. The EQA schemes we participate in are professional bodies, professional standard units, those, those bodies that um, make recommendations and determination on what quality and pathology looks like. There's a kind of harder edge regulatory bodies, um, and I think you can probably include some of those as well. And the EQA schemes um, report are overseen by the National Quality Assessment Advisory Panels and the Joint Working Group. Now, of course, what's actually supposed to be there in theory, but in practice your question is the links um, to CQC, which is the, the body that is responsible primarily for 
assessing quality overall in healthcare in the UK, and also the commissioners who ultimately pay for the, um, the services that we support. So, in reality, these links in the past have been sort of um, probably more theoretical than actual. So what I'll do now is I'll just run through those eight main recommendations of the PQAR, what they said and what they appear to mean. So the first recommendation was essentially professionalising quality management. <coughs> and what the recommendation was, was that Health Education England should lead a systemic approach to develop um, quality management, quality improvement skills in the pathology workforce, which should be recognised as an essential requirement in CPD and individual appraisal requirements. So this is like saying, well, yeah, you know, we, we do quality management. Um, qu the quality management has evolved and I think would now be recognised by all um, pathology providers as being an essential part of what we do. But this is actually firming it up and saying, you know, just as, you know, I'm expected to, um, you know, keep up to date with, uh, with advances in, um, you know, hemato-oncology as part of my sort of professional work, and I'm supposed to have, you know, CPD, and that's fed into my appraisal. If I'm involved in quality management and taking a leading role in that, there should be a similar requirement. Second recommendation was basically beefing up the joint working group and focusing on individual performance. The role of the joint working group um, has been in place for many years and, and basically it oversees um, dealing with poor performance and that's fed up through the, the um, NQOPs. This is really saying that, well, as well as doing that, the joint working group should actually take on much more of a standard setting role and focus that much more on individuals as well as on laboratories. Um, and the, there's a recommendation that the membership should also be expanded. So should set standards and performance criteria, should advise on publication of performance data. So this, you know, this is really getting a harder edge and it's taking us more and more into the world that you know, the cardiothoracic surgeons are already familiar with, that the quality of what you do data that, that, that exists informing that is going to be in the public domain. And that further consideration should be given to assessing individual performance. Now this is an interesting aspect of the Barnes report that although what kicked it off was problem in actually reacting to um, poor performance highlighted in a technical scheme and, and basically I think as I understand it the failure was really the, the, the lack of organisational reaction to, to QA results but the Barnes report has actually moved much more into this area of individual performance and us as individuals. Um, so I think it's, it's almost like it was, it was set off by one thing but it's identified another thing that's really gone at. Okay, third recommendation, and I think this is very much the theme that's at the heart of the report, is that pathology QA must link into provider clinical governance systems. And if you remember the, the first little diagram, there's that, the, the, the green arrows in the, the central box, what should happen in practice, well, in, in theory, but in practice maybe doesn't. And the recommendation was that the quality and governance systems of pathology providers must be integrated with trust governance and quality structures with identification of accountable board members. So this is all this, 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 is all this sort of the, the, this theme running through. It's no longer going to be about, you know, this sort of general management of quality. It's going to be you, 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 you're accountable. Um, and of course, you know, if you ask any random trust chief executive, what can you tell us about um, QA results in your laboratories? And what are they going to say? Unless they've got a particular problem, they're, they're not going to know anything about it. So the, the Barnes report is saying, well, there should be someone on the board who holds a ring on this and keeps an eye on it. Okay. 
Next recommendation, basically do error reporting properly and openly. And here I think there's a little bit of a conflict being to run in, into this, as I'll explain. So the recommendation was that trust should adhere to existing guidance on error reporting. So whether you sit under uh, uh, the Trust Development Authority or monitor, depending whether you're an NH NHS trust or a foundation trust, and of course everyone sits under the CQC, Trust should be encouraged to adhere to existing guidance. Now, of course, every trust will have its system of error reporting. Um, what isn't clear, and I, th I think the, the Bond report implies that this is actually very variable, is to what extent laboratory errors get fed into that system and to what extent there is organisational awareness. Um, and also also, the issue of pathology providers should share knowledge from lessons learned. Now, this harks back to the sort of the, the, the culture of the NHS um, in the sort of circa 2000 era, where there was a strong move to to get away from the blame culture, share experience of things going wrong, so we can all collectively learn. Um, Unfortunately, this actually kind of runs slightly in, in, in contrast to the, um, the sort of rather personalising um, theme of, of this report, which is kind of more in line with, uh, you know, the sort of post-Francis um, NHS accelerated blame culture. So I think this is a very good recommendation. How it works in practice, I'm not so sure. Right, next recommendation is basically make the National Laboratory Medicine Catalogue meaningful. And the recommendation was continued development of the uh, National Laboratory Medicine Catalogue to ensure consistency of data and information. So the professional bodies, IVD manufacturers and others, should work towards minimising the differences between analytical processes, requests and reporting. Um, so I think, I'm sure everyone in the room would agree with that as, as an objective in terms of the, the, the bottom line. And you know the, the, the National Laboratory Medicine Catalogue being a vehicle for this would seem to be a reasonable su suggestion. I suppose the devil here, in, in, the devil in detail here, is how do you actually get everyone to work together? This is a kind of recommendation, easy to make, perhaps rather more difficult to, um, to, to um, implement in practice. Okay, so next recommendation. UCAS to make current accreditation status visible and relevant, which is, to me, a little bit surprising, because I thought, well, doesn't UCAS already do that? But I wonder whether there's something else behind this. So the recommendation is, where well, UCAS has agreed, um, to re regularly update the accreditation status of laboratories in order to ensure that accreditation status is shorthand for a quality assured service, so that you know UCAS accreditation is it's like a kite mark, um, which is, I suppose is a kind of con the concept that we already have. But if you then go on the UCAS website and have a look at, you know, the long list of accredited laboratories, it's actually very reassuring, and it looks like we're, we're all in pretty good shape. So knowing what the culture in NHS England is like, I wonder whether they're going to wake up to this and think, hmm, we want a bit more detail. We want to know how good is someone's accreditation, but we'll have to wait and see. Next recommendation updates the uh, Pathology Services um, Commissioning Toolkit. I was a little bit surprised by this because I thought that the Pathology Services Commissioning Toolkit is really about how to put your direct access pathology services out to tender. So. To me, the, the, the link between this and the PQAR um, was not, not that obvious, and, and still isn't really, and I think this is perhaps uh, uh, an issue for, for, for debates um, about, well, how should the, uh, the commissioning toolkit be updated to take on board um, QA? Obviously, I think, I, and I'm sure uh, most of you would welcome the idea that when, you com when you're tendering services, it shouldn't just be about cost, it should be about quality as well. Um, how that works in practice, we'll have to wait and see. The final recommendation was to establish an oversight group and a dashboard. So rather than 
pathology QA remaining kind of enclosed in the sort of the, in, in, in its former world, going no further than the joint working group, that there should be a body, a national body that is in effect outside the the, 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 the pathology profession broadly, um, working for NHS England and really holding us collectively to account. And that um, there should be a, a dashboard developed that uh, gives visibility of quality of, of um, pathology providers using standardised data. So the recommendation was a national oversight group should be established through NHS England. And of course that you know, raises a, qu a question as well that we've, we've immediately got this potential conflict that um, our QA schemes tend to cover the UK and of course a lot of them are actually you know, international as well. Um, the oversight of this is going to sit within a kind of, a, if you like, a parochial NHS body, NHS England. But I suppose it's not obvious where else it would sit. Um, and that this oversight group will oversee improvements in QA governance mechanisms. So it's not really interested in how we do QA, it's the governance of it and develop the pathology QA dashboard. And I'm a cellular pathologist, so I'll just take you through a little bit of fine print relevant to cellular pathology. To non-cellular pathologists, I apologise for this a bit, but not completely, because the thing about cellular pathology um, QA is that it is very much biased towards interpretive um, EQA. Um, you know, the, the, the pathologist is the analyzer, and you know, we we are the, we are providing the primary output. But of course, every pathology discipline provides um, clinical interpretation and advice. So there is a there is the issue of how do you how do you QA that? And I think that is very difficult, but it is something we're going to have to take, take forward. So the first of these recommendations was that the professional bodies led by the Royal College should develop methodologies for assessing the performance of individuals in EQA schemes that will give a fair and accurate picture of their competence to practice. So that's actually put in a lot of, of um, significance on how you do in EQA schemes. But the trouble is, what else is there? Now in terms of, you know, if you ask me, how do I know I'm any good as a pathologist? Well, all right, I've got my FRC path many years ago. Um, that doesn't seem like a particularly, to me, a particularly good evidence base that once upon a time I was capable of passing an exam. Although I have colleagues who say, well, that's it, you know, I'm a fellow of the Royal College, I'm, you know, I'm, 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 I'm listed as being one of these people, therefore I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I've been deemed competent to practice. So I've got that, and then I've got the results of the EQA schemes I participate in. I haven't actually got a lot else. There, there's, there's lots of kind of soft evidence, but this is hard evidence. And if you ask me, well, okay, your, your EQA results, do they give a fair and accurate picture of your competence to practice? And I might say, well, yeah, I think so. You know, I'm in good standing, I get good scores. But of course, that, that would be slightly dishonest because I know that there are aspects of my practice which are not covered by, by QA. So this is recognized, I think, and this is implicit in this recommendation that um, what we've got now is not quite there. And in terms of giving a fair and accurate picture of competence to practice, we need to have a better evidence base. Okay, appraisal. Um, as part of my, uh, my, my um, portfolio as deputy medical director is I'm trust appraisal lead. Um, so I, 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 this is kind of close to my heart. So this recommendation is all practicing individuals responsible for reporting pathology results and providing clinical advice should be registered with current EQA individual assessment schemes and demonstrate regular participation as defined by the joint working group. This is a key change. Now, up to now, participation has been voluntary. There are certain situations where to do something, um, you're 
that there is a degree of compulsion. For example, one of my areas of practice is, um, is sarcoma pathology, and I'm a member of the Sheffield Sarcoma Multidisciplinary Team. And peer review, cancer peer review measures say that for to be a pathologist in the sarcoma MDT, you have to participate in the relevant EQA scheme. So there's a little bit of um, compulsion coming in, but largely it's voluntary. And of course, this has been one of the great things about the way EQA has evolved, is it's been professionally driven. The, the majority of people do it because we inherently get that it's a good thing to do. But what the Barnes report is saying is no more, now you've actually got to do it. Um, we don't yet actually have clear national recommendations that says which EQA scheme a given individual should be in. And that's something that we're going to have to develop to back this up. And just to give an example of, um, of where this is problematical, there are, in, in cellular pathology, there's a number of regional general schemes and there's a number of national specialist schemes. Now, if you are a, a, gen, a, a generalist histopathologist working in uh, a district general hospital, as many people are, and you, you're participating, you, you are reporting in, um, say, gynecological pathology or urological pathology, when should you be in the specialist scheme? And when is it okay to just be in the generalist scheme? We haven't defined that yet. Okay, so that's the next aspect of this is that um, we should achieve appropriate levels of performance as determined by the professional bodies. Now, that's, a, that's an interesting one. Um, performance in individual schemes should be discussed and noted at annual appraisal. And this is another, another change because it says, it says performance. Up to now, all we've had to declare in, in cell path is we are in such and such a scheme. And our performance has been um, confidential between ourselves and the, the scheme. Not now, they're saying you should discuss this with your appraiser. What does your data look like? Where opportunities are a need to improve are identified, additional remedial training should be required or practice in the area of concern should be stopped. So, okay, so I start to do badly in one of my EQA schemes. What do I do? I just shrug my shoulders and say, well, maybe I'll do better next circulation. No, I need to do something about this. I need to either improve my practice, find a way to improve my practice, be that, you know, additional CPD, supervised practice, something like that, or I start working that area. This process should be noted formally as part of governance procedures with support from the employing organisation. Now, I think this is actually very important, and, and this, is, this is an area that I know a lot of people are quite uncomfortable with. But what should happen, of course, is if, say, I'm, I'm doing badly in one of my schemes, and I tell my, I, you know, spill the beans to my appraiser, I'm struggling with, with this particular scheme, then by making that declaration, it becomes a shared problem. It's a responsibility of myself to do something about it. It's also a responsibility of my trust to support me in doing something about it. So the way this should work is it becomes a shared problem. Obviously, I'm kind of a little bit nervous that that may not always be the, in the case. I know that in my own trust, it will be a shared problem. The trust would support appropriate remedial action. Not every, or, uh, not every um, employing organisation might view it in that way. And of course, in doing that, there are resource implications. Uh, e the, this next um, recommendation states that EQA schemes are designed to assess and improve individual performance, and employing organisations should ensure that resources are made available to support participation and remedial action if required. So um, it means that you know, if you're participating in an EQA scheme, there's a subscription that's paid for running it. Well, you know, your organiser shouldn't quibble about paying that. Also, if you need further CPD, again, they should support that. Now, this is a particularly controversial thing amongst cellular pathologists. Provider organisations and professional bodies should ensure that individuals understand that EQA schemes are designed to assess and improve individual performance, not laboratory performance, individual performance, and that attempts at collusion are considered matters of professional probity. 
Now, of course, there is another point of view that if QA is, um, is reflecting our day-to-day -day practice, if you have a difficult case you're not sure of, what do you do? You consult a colleague. But, as you're saying, if in, in, in your EQA, you can't do that. Um, you've got to work it out for yourself, because this is about assessment of individual performance. Although, you know, people are not happy with that, but that's the, the, the position that's been taken. And my personal view on this is that, well, we recognise that, and it, in recognising that, the design of the schemes should take into account that this is just individuals. You, you know, when you're, you're doing a scheme, you don't have the option of, um, of conferring, because that would be regarded as collusion. Of course, it's, in practice, it's something which um, is very difficult to police, but it is a, a principle that's been set. So I think, you know, the, to, to sum this up, the, the, the key theme of the PQAR is that of governance. Not all organisations need to know about, care about, and react to the quality of what we do and support us in delivering that quality so that our chief executives in future will actually be bothered about what we're getting up to in the lab. Okay, so that was the review, that's what it said. What's happened? Well, college response. New, a new committee structure was proposed to replace the current joint working group and national quality assessment advisory panels. And the initial suggestion was interpretive EQA was to be linked to professional standards. Or maybe not, there's a change of position on that now. Interpretive and technical EQA oversight was to be separated. So there's this rec recognition that there are different implications. Now, my personal take on this is if you have an EQA scheme, it is an EQA scheme, whatever you are quality assuring, whether it's in individual interpretation or it's an analytical scheme, numerical scheme, the principles on which we run these things are very similar. But of course, the, the thing with in, interpretive EQA is it has implications for the individual professional. So the college wanted to separate them. And also, they wanted to um, no longer host the um, Cellular Pathology Interpretive EQA Scheme Organisers meetings, because the, the scheme organisers formed a group which would meet once a year and hosted by the college. And this has actually been a very useful engine for driving the development of this particular area of EQA. But of course, the problem that this brings in is you've got the same organisation, broadly the college, both overseeing the development of the schemes, but also holding them to account in terms of performance. And the college has gone into hiding. Uh, it no longer lives there at Two Cotton House Terrace. OK, so looking at those, the, the eight recommendations again, just saying what's actually happened. So freshly professionalising quality management I don't know. There might, might be someone else in the room who knows more about this, but I'm, I'm not sure that really there's been any, any development that's yet become visible nationally um, on this front. Um, but perhaps, you know, given the, the sort of the still rather unstable and poorly resourced um, infrastructure that's being asked to, to deal with that, perhaps we shouldn't be too surprised. So beefing up the joint working group. Now that's ongoing because the college actually proposed the opposite. I mean, it was actually quite, I suppose I'm, 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 this is where my angle as a member of the joint working group comes in, but the Barnes report had very specific recommendations and the college was initially said, oh, we're just gonna get rid of that group completely. Um, they moved back from that position, but discussions are ongoing and indeed, the question is coming more and more into focus. Should the joint working group actually be hosted by the college or should it be completely independent of the college? Next one, a pathology QA must link into provider clinical governance systems. Well, 
to an extent this already happens, but that varies from place to place. But this really has not become visible at a national level. Um, I'm really not sure what the level of awareness in the boards of provider organisations of the bond report is. Do our reporting properly and openly? Well, I think it's no visible pro progress on this one. The post-Francis duty of candor has implications, so that under that, if harm befalls a patient that is due to um, a failure in laboratory processes, then that needs to be declared to the patient. But that's something going wrong. What about the failure in QA? Actually, is that going to be relevant? I think that's yet to be tested out. But potentially it could be, because that would have applied um, in King's Mill. So I think there is, there's pressure to be open about this. But in terms of actually getting, that's in individual cases, in terms of getting benefit from error reporting and learning from it, um, I don't think anything really palpable has, has come from that yet. Okay, making the National Laboratory Medicine Catalogue meaningful, well, its last release was April 2014. I'm not sure what's happening in terms of, um, of updating it, but I, I remain optimistic that this is a recommendation I'd like to see, see go forward, and maybe other people in the audience will know more about it than me. UCAS to make current accreditation status visible and relevant. Well, at the moment, it's really it's effectively a binary measurement, isn't it? You're accredited or, or you're not. And I just wonder whether, as... NHS England wake up to this, whether they're going to be happy with that. But at the moment, it actually paints a pretty good picture. Updating the Pathology Services Commissioning Toolkit. Well, in terms of what's in the public domain, it's not been updated yet. And as I say, the, the original version was very heavily biased towards how you go about reconfiguring direct access testing. Because, of course, the thing with commissioning pathology is there's not very much pathology that is directly commissioned. Most of it's indirectly commissioned. And generally, when commissioners try to actually get involved in this, it doesn't tend to make that much progress because of the, the indirect way, way it is commissioned. So I think, you know, watch this space. Uh, I would like uh, an updated version of um, the, the, the toolkit to have definite requirements <coughs> about QA. And the final one, establish the oversight group and dashboard. Well, the oversight group is now established. It's been chaired by Samira Gray. And the dashboard is going to go forward, but the Department of Health has said they'll pay for the dashboard, but they're not going to resource any other recommendations from the Barnes report. That's considered, that's like over to you. That's for... for providers and the, the wider pathology community to do something about. Um, but the dashboard will go ahead. So, where's this all taking us? There's a potential mismatch between the ambitions of the review and the resources, as I've just mentioned. Um, so this could be like many other national initiatives that it gradually fades and gathers dust. This was in the context of a relatively mature EQA um, world internationally for numerical and technical schemes. I mean, how you do QA is pretty, is, is, is really quite well set. It's, it's not like, you know, we're, we're sort of in, in the foothills. But by contrast, interpretive schemes are a problem um, because there's this, this realisation that we need to do this. We need to, ideally, we need to quality assure everything that we do in pathology. Um, but it's, it's difficult because it focuses on individuals' professional existence. Um, and, of course, the other thing is that if you start to say, well, this is what we expect of pathology, what about other diagnostic disciplines? What about medical imaging, for example? You know, you know, the, many other areas is there is really minimal or no QA of um, interpretive reporting. 
So implications for schemes, well, I think that the reporting structure for numerical or technical schemes will probably not change very much. There may be more focus on the approach to identifying poor performance, and the approaches may change. Um, I mean, at the moment, we, you know, we tend to kind of pick up on laboratories that are, you know, hitting the, you know, the, the, the edge of, of performance in terms of the, the, the distribution curve. But maybe we should also be having a look at those which are kind of bumping along the bottom that, you know, they're not actually, by our definitions, becoming poor performers, but they seem to be struggling a bit and may actually benefit from having that highlighted and, and having some remedial um, steps taken. But poor performance is likely to become more visible in, in terms of lines of reporting. Um, I don't think the dashboard is going to have much granularity at first, but it may be a sort of opening the door to a future in which actually our, our um, QA results are far more public and, and uh, there will be expectations of reporting. And in, in terms of schemes, we'll have to re-examine their methodology to ensure that they are as fair and representative and relevant as possible to clinical practice. Um, and there are also some real challenges in this. For example, in interpretive um, QA schemes, where you're looking at, a, a, at an image, look at, look at an image down the microscope, actually getting that image to all your scheme participants up and down the country and increasingly in, in other countries. You know, how do you do that? Well, we, of course, we now have the technology to pr provide very high quality digital images. And more and more schemes are beginning to use this, go down that line. But the problem is, that is not the way that the vast majority of people work in their day-to-day -day practice. So that for the sake of being able to, to QA everyone on the same image and also on you know, ranges of images, you know, small specimens and so on and so forth, you run into this other problem that is it really representative of professional practice? And there's not an easy answer to that. So implications for laboratories, I think we'll need a clearer narrative on QA within their provider organisations. Um, we're probably at the stage of we should be volunteering this. We're not yet being asked for it. In time, we may be asked for it. There's this desire for accreditation being a kite mark, which I think really, in a sense, is nothing new. But it is, it is something that I think that the mentality of the NHS likes to have, well, you know, tick that box and then it's fine, we don't have to worry about that anymore. And then this requirement to professionalise uh, quality management, um, if that particular PQAL proposal becomes reality. And we'll have to learn to live with a dashboard, but hey, you know, that's life in the NHS, isn't it? Okay. Implications for individuals, Particip participation in schemes is no longer optional. And there'll be a formal link to appraisal, and therefore for, um, for, for medics, um, that links to our revalidation. Um, so, you know, in theory, there's a link between your QA performance and whether you continue to practice medicine. So, actually, welcome to the world of the surgeons. So, to conclude, I think the NHS in England has woken up to the fact that quality assessment in pathology matters, and colleagues north of the border will probably say, well, yeah, Scotland woke up to that about 20 years ago, and that's why Scotland came up with the first uh, interpretive EQA scheme. But now, there is this awareness. There's a desire to harmonise upwards, well, you know, that's normally what the desire is, isn't it? But there's a significant gap between the theory and the reality. Actually, if you look at all the rec recommendations of Barnes' report, to turn them into reality on the ground is actually quite a challenge and will require resourcing. But what I would say is the requirement for rigorous and transparent EQA is only moving in one direction. Thank you very much. Thank you, David, um, for a 
very good analysis of, of, of the report and its implications. Um, the thing that um, occurs to me, and echoing one of the things you said, was that in, in some ways pathology is, is, is at the forefront of, of quality in, in uh, uh, diagnostics um, in the NHS. And th th there are, I know that the Chief Scientific Officer's uh, group of scientific directors are actively working on, on promoting uh, quality and accreditation across all the diagnostic um, sciences. Uh, so there is an economy in scale for health education England in actually professionalising um, quality management uh, that goes right the way across all the sciences. Um, the, the other th the thing that I would say is that given the focus on governance, some of those recommendations are things that I would have assumed, as you did, that were already in place. So the integration with trust clinical <coughs> governance systems and so forth was something that should have been established years ago under different um, uh, reports, the standards for better care and so forth. And it's interesting that we still need to do work on that. Um, anyway, does anyone have any questions? Can I ask one of you for a start? How many people uh, are familiar with the laboratory medicine catalogue and, and look at it? Not a lot. And, and, and how many have, have, have read um, the uh, pathology um, commissioning toolkit? I wouldn't recommend it for night time reading, actually. <laughs> okay, are there any other questions? Just comment, actually, it's, it's, it's interesting that um, I gave a talk on, on this subject uh, last week at, at Paths Off in Dublin, and I actually asked that, the same questions. Mm. Um, and the answer, the first one was the college president and two people sat next to her, put their hands up, no one else did. <laughs> their commissioning toolkit was just drew a blank. Yes. <laughs> David, did you have something to say? Uh, I am a biomedical scientist from Southampton General Hospital. Uh, this report stresses too much on MSc program, a modernizing scientific career program, <coughs> which produces very high quality scientists, as they claim. So what actually happened, that now they have created two classes of scientists. One, that have been selected by, the, by this program, and the other, the routine one class is in minority, and they receive very special attention with their training. The other class in, is in majority, and they do not receive that much attention. This is the ground reality, but I am talking about. Uh, has this report taken into consideration the impact of this in long term? Because uh, I think that in longer term, it may adversely affect the quality instead of improving the quality because of this creation. Yeah, well, the, the, the report actually is pretty much silent on this, um, w which is interesting. Um, I mean, in theory, um, if you harmonise the quality of QA for any particular test, any reporting of a particular test, then you should, that should mitigate against any kind of two-tier <laughs> level of practice. Um, but that's the theory. I mean, it's, you know, I'm, I'm interested to hear you, you make that comment because, you know, I've, I've heard similar comments from other people as well. I mean, is, is there anyone else who'd like to kind of pick up on that? That essentially that the that um, modernising scientific careers and, and, and what it's kind of creating in terms of the professional structure might have a sort of perverse. A negative effect on quality. I'm sure Professor Sue Hill would be mortified if she thought that. But <laughs> yeah, because I mean, clearly it's not, that was not the, atten the intention of, yeah. uh, behind the, the program. Yeah. Chris. David, uh, very good talk. Um, one question I have, or a couple, maybe one question, is from a from a clinician perspective, um, 
should we be looking for bona fide um, uh, quality assurance schemes to participate in? For example, um, where I work, we um, have obviously the opportunity to participate in NEQAS um, and the NEQAS Part 2. Um, uh, but there is also a local morphology scheme or a regional morphology scheme. Um, and if um, in the future your individual performance is going to perhaps impact on your revalidation, should we be seeking, I um, in effect, participation in quality assurance schemes that are kite marked? Um, secondly, um, it's quite interesting you talk about the focus on the individual um, and there are working practices where we interpret data collectively with um, molecular uh, geneticists or histopathologists as hematologists and so on and so forth. Um, so I'm now thinking, well, well, if you're doing the part two, should I actually be just focusing on that as an individual performer? rather than collectively with laboratory colleagues, which actually reflects the way that some of my work um, is done. Okay, well, um, yeah, I, th I think that uh, picking up on the first point, what you're highlighting is a potential problem. And of course, I mean, it's, 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 it's I think, well recognised in areas of practice where there are multiple scheme providers, is how do you ensure that it's a, a uniform standard and that, you know, if, you, if you're struggling a bit in one scheme, I'll go to the easier one and, and then my results will look good. And, you know, we're going to have to deal with that um, in terms of interpretive schemes as well. Uh, there are a number of regional um, general schemes in, um, in histopathology up and down the country. What I couldn't tell you is, are any of them easier than others? Um, they might be, and we, we, we need to sort of have a, a means of harmonising them, but, but at the moment that is a problem. Um, and of course, you, you know, it does actually give us a perverse incentive to, you know, if, if, if we've got to have the quality of our work assessed in some way, and it's actually linked to our revalidation, do we want to make, give ourselves as easy a ride as possible? So that's something which is potentially a problem. Um, that I think has, has to be, 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 uh, be looked at. Um, the second question is a very interesting one, and that is that um, although this, the Barnes report focuses on individual um, EQA, how do you QA a collective output? Like, for example, in, in um, hemato-oncology, um, what we do is integrated reporting. You, you pull together the, uh, the, the results from from bone marrow morphology, from flow cytometry, cytogenetics, molecular genetics, to come up with a diagnosis for that patient. And that's largely a team effort. How do you QA that? And I think that's something which we need to give further thought to mm. going forward, because clearly we need to do it. Definitely. OK, David, do you have a question? Because you have an appointment here very shortly. Uh, just quickly. Yeah. Do you think this is in danger of gathering dust on a shelf somewhere, all this? Yeah, I think it is. I, I, th I think that um, there's a lot of positive content in this report. Um, there's a lot that I think does need to be done. But there, I think two things can stymie it and, uh, and potentially are at the moment. One is the lack of resources available to take the sort of developmental side of it forward. And the second thing is that I think the college have really struggled with their side of it, um, and that that's actually, I think, really slowed down the, the implementation. Of course, the, the risk of implementation of any report happens best if it's shortly after it's published, when it's, you know, there's visibility, people are aware of it. There is a danger that, that this could gather dust, absolutely. Okay, thank you very much, David.